Britannia Classic, Benji. Uh, completely different race. We have Pagacha here, Alaphilippe, Cosnerfoy, Ben Herman's in good form, Ethan Hayter, the young talent for Ineos, Dion Smith, good sprint, I think did well last year for Bike Exchange, but no Matthews, David Decker, long course. It's, if anyone doesn't know, it's in uh, West France, in Britannia region, 254Ks, and it is rolling short, punchy hills all day. It is very, very hard stage. Matthews won it last year on Sunweb after Niels Echoff led him out. But you were watching it pretty closely, Benji. Where was this gravel section and who was like taking control beforehand managing breaks? Well, before we get to that gravel section, I do want to talk about the initial breakaway being Alexis Gujar, Alessandro De Marchi, Grignard and Hermans because they were still alive when that gravel section happened. They're also still alive, hopefully. And they were ahead with a good two minutes, two minutes and a half even at that gravel section which was uh let's hope i don't ruin his name south talarin section 1.4 kilometers 4.7 percent gravel section at roughly 70k to go less probably 60k to go and that is where everything lit up and it was alaphilippe that was making the first move and trying to break it open in the group and we saw the people that we expected reacting on it like a pogachar we obviously saw his gravel skills already in Strade Bianche, so it's not new here. We also saw it, saw it a bit on Plateau de Glier, but that was not that great last year. But uh, here it was looking good. He was following Alaphilippe quite well, and Honoré was able to follow as well. But also Benoit Cosnefa, your, uh, your favorite rider. But you just don't know it yet. <laughs> no, actually, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, the thing there was that from that group, you'd expect those riders to be a a solid group to ride away, but the likes of a Steven missed the group and they weren't happy with that. So Steven tried again after the gravel section to try and get to that group, but failed to do so. So they ended up putting Trek riders at the front and the gap was up to like a minute roughly between that peloton and the group that got away, including Alaphilippe. They were still behind the breakaway that was falling apart at the front. I think the Marquis was the last one to survive. Quinton Hedman was the second last one. And eventually that group would end up collecting the marquee as well but uh, there was one rider in the group that wasn't looking too good and i think we've seen his pain face quite a few times right this season i gotcha well not have we seen his pain face a few times Von two know. uae tour <laughs> On to UA2, I guess, true. He doesn't really hide his emotions. Like when Pogacha is looking bad, he is looking bad. And he fully, he fully cracked today. It wasn't like Von 2 where he just like, oh, ease up a bit, you know, catch yeah. him back later. This was a full, full cracking. And I don't know whether it's because it's over 20 degrees C. I don't know whether it's because. First race back, I think. <laughs> he just doesn't, yeah. Not exactly his AA target this race. Too many um, pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's probably, the guy's probably been celebrating after yeah. Olympics. Remember, he didn't go straight home. He had to go to the Olympics and after the Tour de France. So good to see him at least mixing it up, going to this race. Uh, but yeah, the pace was just too much for him. I think, what's on his program next? Is he doing? Uh, European champs, world champs, but I don't know what other races in Lombardia, between. Lombardia, apparently, according to PCS. Okay. So that'll be interesting. Good good warm-up for him. Uh, are you surprised Avon Paul didn't do this race, Benji? I mean, he did Brussels Cycling Classic and the um, Druven Curse one, whatever it's called. Uh, around his, his local races, but this is a world tour race. Why didn't he come and do this? I think it's because tomorrow he's starting the Benelux store, but I'm not 100% uh, certain. Yes, I would. recall him being on the start list, and perhaps it's not ideal to no, go from right. Belgium to France and then from France to Belgium. I don't know what the, the travel restrictions in Europe are at, at all anymore because <laughs> I can't follow at all. But hey, <laughs> as long as I don't need to travel, it's not a problem for me. But uh, yeah, Evenepoel is not on the start list, but Pogacar indeed was uh, dropping from the group, and it was all of a sudden, like you said, but then something happened then. It was Terpstra being attacked by four cows <laughs> on the road, like literally walking ahead of him on the road. He had to literally like pedal 5K an hour to try and get past him, and I don't know where in the race Terpstra was because I really couldn't tell whether it was at the back of the peloton or something. It would be a problem if it's ahead of the peloton, <laughs> so... I guess it was behind the peloton that was happening, but um, in past lives, you would have expected Telstra to be there, right? Yeah, in a, a long time ago. I mean, he actually looked a bit better at the Arctic Race of Norway, yeah. that stage break with Volsleben beat him in the sprint. Uh, if people were, were watching, I had a video on that. Uh, but yeah, they now had a break of two quick step riders, Honoré and Alaphilippe, with Benoit Kosnerfoy. Now, 
Klausner is actually quite fast. He just lost a sprint to Casper Pedersen in Paris Tour last year. I think I think he's very fast, but he has lost sprints to I think Brabant Pale. He lost uh, Matthew Van der Poel and Alphilippe through bad positioning and bad tactics. Mainly, he decided to leave those guys out, uh, which is a bit risky. But he approached this. I think both approached it in a little bit of a weird way. The peloton, particularly the peloton. Uh, but Kozlov just most of his strategy was to pull. He pulled with the other two. He would like half attack over the rises and then sit up when Alphilippe marked him and Honoré was struggling and then it would come back again and sort of then keep working with those guys. So, like, do you think that was a mistake, Benji? Do you think he just knew that he could beat Alphilippe in the sprint or did he just not really have a plan about how to – because what I would have done if I was him would be to just work with those guys and maybe not pull full but give them a pull here and there and then – beat Alaphilippe if you trusted the sprint? Or was he worried, if I don't tire out Honoré, he's going to attack me and I'm going to have to start closing attacks? I think that his idea was all right to try at least one attack. Because if you don't try any attack, you don't know about any form that these riders currently True. have in that part of the race. If you make an attack and you see Honoré drop, then you know that he's not going to be the best of the two and that Alaphilippe is likely going to be their candidate to go for this stage. And then you can try focusing on one rider a bit more than the other, but the problem is that he kept on riding quite a bit with Alaphilippe in his wheel. And obviously Alaphilippe's not going to take over because Honoré just got dropped by Benoit Cosnefra and Cosnefra turned around and started complaining at Alaphilippe for not taking over. But obviously he's not going to do that. <laughs> it would be the stupidest thing ever if Alaphilippe starts riding there uh, unless he like completely has confidence about it. So at that point, when you see that Alaphilippe's not taking over, obviously, then you probably end up just with Honoré back in the group and right with three again. Like you said, that was indeed what I had in mind as well at the moment of uh, that part in the race. And from that point onwards, it was going to be one thing or the other for him. Either he finds a way to drop both of them and rides to victory, which seemed to be unlikely based on the fact that he couldn't drop Alaphilippe there. Either he ends up winning the sprint against both of them, which is also a possibility to win the race. or he ends up trying this again and only drops one and has the same exact situation. So you either have to drop two or you have to drop zero and go full for your sprint. And he ended up trying the first thing again, right? Because I swear we had another attack on the section where Pitcock attacked last year and he, uh, he actually looked pretty good there. He just, yeah, he looked he actually looked better than our fleet and maybe that's what he was doing. Maybe he was trying to get information about how they're both feeling. Um, I don't know, it... It also was risky what they were doing because I think a competent peloton, and uh, there's two teams I want to point out, well, a few people actually. FDJ didn't really pull the gap back. They just preferred to attack with Valentin Madawa. Israel's startup nation would not really pace and then try to attack with Hermans three or four times I saw. And the gap is at 50 seconds with like 15 kilometers to go and then they try to get it eight kilometers to go it's at 50 seconds you're not going to solo bridge 50 seconds you need to bring it down to 15 or 20 max warren bargi then on another rise attacked on one of the longer hills gap was at like 55 seconds it just disrupted and it just allows ballerini closes ballerini blocks Cat- catania closes catania blocks and you instead of just pulling it close and then actually bridging across um, so Quickstep were doing a magnificent job blocking behind with Catania and Ballerini. And uh, Ineos Benji had Luke Rowe, Ethan Hayter, their man for the final sprint. I did not see them on the front once in the last 20 kilometers. I saw Luke Rowe in the group. Now, apparently Amador Rivera might have paced earlier, but I, I couldn't believe, given how close yep. this ended up being, that Luke Rowe wasn't pacing. Yeah, I mean, either end, it's, it's kind of surprising that they just didn't take that up because Ethan Hafer was one of the riders I would have expected to have a chance at winning this race if it all came together, certainly, because I feel like his sprint these days is better than Alaphilippe and Cosner Frost, certainly, based on what we've seen so far. Ethan Hafer is like the kind of rider that was at Ineos for quite a bit right now, and he's always moving in these races that are not on the forefront, but he's winning in those races, and those races are becoming better and better races, and at this point, he is certainly a candidate for races like this just to win it. And Ineos should start trusting that more. Perhaps Roe couldn't anymore. Perhaps he didn't have anything anymore because it's quite a hilly parkour. And wow, Roe has done well on 
hills before in the Tour de France were for pacing, but this is a bit of a high pressure race and perhaps that was what hurt him the most. But in the end, I would have, uh, I would have uh, expected him to pace a bit more for Hater certainly. And I would even dare to say that he might be a candidate as a rider that could do well at the World Championship Paco. But the problem there is that I don't know how good he is on that length of Paco. Well, actually, this is 251 yeah, kilometers. Yeah, super long. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess this proves it. Even Hater is my outsider for the World Championships. <laughs> yeah, he's in really, really good shape. And that was surprising. Up front, we had the group still working pretty well together. Honoré kept getting dropped on every rise. He'd come back. And then he, in the last one, he just went full on the front for Alaphilippe because Connor Swift for Azizur, uh, not Azizur, Arkas Samzik was closing behind another British rider who's really good in these races, actually. He's 25. He's actually signed through next year, but he's been actually good for them. He won Trobroli on this year. He was closing really, really quickly. So Honoré gets on the front, drills it, basically leads out Cosner for his second wheel. They get onto the, the last 300 metres is a nasty uphill rise. It suited Matthews last year. Alaphilippe tries to get the jump on Cosner Fra and box him in a little bit, exactly what he did to MVDP and uh, Cosner Fra in that Brabantse Pale I mentioned. But Cosner Fra jumps out early enough to prevent that happening. And you can just see Alaphilippe isn't able to keep, keep kicking longer than about six seconds. And Cosner Fra wins this uphill sprint easily in the end ahead of Alaphilippe and Honoré. It's not the full standard because it was only two quick steppers, but he did get the better of the two, you know, the world champ. Honoré, who was good at San Sebastian, won in, you know, in a group with him as well as Ballerini and the whole quick step team blocking behind. Behind, Hater wins the reduced bunch kick for fourth. Thirteen. It was only 13 seconds, by the way, 13 seconds behind. The Peloton have been a bit more coordinated. Swift, then Bonomo, Sturven, Madua, Pasha, and Giacomo Nizzolo. My question, Benji, is Sturven, does that change your opinion on his world champs inclusion in the Belgian team? Certainly. Like The problem with Sturven's inclusion for me is that we didn't see him race since the Tour de France. So I would uh, not be able to say whether he would fit in the team or would not fit in the team. And this shows that he is. I think he's... Is he also riding Bing Bang Tour? Well, Benelux Tour, it's called now. But uh, yeah, I don't know why that changed because the sponsor is gone, I guess. Which Prince Renko could have done this race. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if he's racing that, then we'll see even more of him. But yeah, he's uh, he's definitely uh, one of the pro people that should be uh, doing well there. I think that the coach of Belgium also visited um, him and Livigno the other day, but I don't know about him visiting Wout van Aert there, but if he's there, then he might as well visit Steven as well. So I think that he selected uh, as well for the team, and he should be because it's in his hometown, Leuven. So that would be a, a pretty crazy thing to have Steven win the World Championships in a, in that place. But he's rider that is an outsider for it, and I'm not sure he's uh, going to be the favorite because Belgium seems to be going all out for Van Aert based on the stories I've heard from uh, the team at least so far. Man, he can, if you pick him, will he lead out Pedersen or Wout van Aert? He might get confused and accidentally lead out Mads Pedersen. The yeah, there's a lot of discussions about the Belgian team because there's so many riders you could pick. You could pick Phillips and Merlier, but those are two other leaders that you could pick. Now, can those survive the hills? We know that Phillips and can survive the hills. Merlier is a bit on the I'm not sure he can list. But then you've got Avenepool, who's been riding these solos. Sure, it's not against good competition. Well, it's decent competition, but it's not World Tour competition. So you can't really look at that and say, oh, he's going to be doing it at the World Championships as well. But it's a rider that if you don't pick Remco Avenepool for the World Championships as a Belgian coach, and you do not win the World Championships, then you're going to get oh, scrutinized the day after. <laughs> I can tell you that. Yeah, some interesting stuff there. And this was a bit of a precursor to that. Some guys trying to tune up for that World Championships race. Good to see Pogaccio back in action and good to see Cosnifra winning. Is this his first? He doesn't actually win that. Oh, he does win that often, but it's his first World Tour level win. Never even won at Dot Pro, Benji. <laughs> it's, he's won all these <laughs> Parry Camembert. They're all named after cheese, these races. He's won. They're all like 1-1, one, 2-1 one, one French races that he's won. But yeah, wins his first his biggest race ever and i think that is his level he's a top guy i think just sometimes gets uh, sent to the wrong races and i was a bit critical he didn't go to the welter but to be honest asia 2r this is probably a bigger win for them than a, a welter stage really um i'd like to see him what else he doing 
other races that I've never heard of before that are back <laughs> back to one one races anyway. <laughs> Instead of going to Benelux Buddy or Tour something. probably fits in. I don't know if that's at the end of the season. Is that has already passed the season? I don't even know which one. <laughs> Buddy Tour. Oh yeah, he'll do that for sure. That's later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's that's his wheelhouse. But yeah, I don't know. Benelux would have been great for him. But anyway, that's what he's doing. Uh, thank. That was the recap of the Britannia Classic West France, a one-day world tour race won by Ben. One we started with. Yeah, this, that's a good point, Benji. This is the race. Our first ever recap was this race, so has a special place in my heart, um, as well as Benoit Cosnefrals and and Michael Matthews, who won that day last year. But we hope you enjoyed the recap. If you want to support the channel, you can like the video down below if you're watching on YouTube or give us a rating or review on podcast players. Until tomorrow's rest day recap for the Welter. Ciao.